Welcome to another spectacular episode of America F1 with Paul Schumann and I'm Sherm Tillman. We have breaking news. Carlos Sainz just signed with Williams in a multi-year deal. He has out clauses and here is Carlos talking live to you. Hi everyone. Today I'm announcing that I will be joining the Williams family from 2025 onwards. As you guys know, it's been an intense few months uh, combining racing with having to decide my future, but now I'm 100% committed and confident that Williams is the right place for me to spend my next few years. I really now, what else do we have on the show? We also are going to talk about the McLaren Mercedes parallel and how to have a bittersweet feeling after a one-two. George's disqualification and Hamilton seen running off with 1.5 kilograms of weight from the Mercedes. Paul, what do you have to say about Carlos Sainz signing with Williams? Uh, hi, everybody. And I have a real issue with uh, the concept that every time somebody leaves Ferrari, so we got to think about Sebastian Alonso and now Sainz. It's the goodbye tour. Oh. It's the money train. It's the, I'm never going to be in a seat that's good enough to get me in a championship. So I will take the offers, the money, the accolades. I'll help train a team. I'll help with the data. But he's never getting back in a proper seat. That's my theory. Don't say that. I'm so, I love Carlos. He's the I love Carlos. smooth operator. Smooth operator. <laughs> How can we not? We'll never hear that song again if he goes to Williams. Will we? If he goes to Williams, I think Williams could turn it around in two to three years. So he will be great for the team. I have no negatives about that. You know, they're signing a guy who's stronger than all. Uh, but I just feel that everybody, when they move away from Ferrari, it really is a bit of a down. And it's a hell of a come down to go from Ferrari to Williams. And obviously, the Mercedes seat was not offered, even if it was temporary. Well, I'm still going to give Carlos a hand because he's still on the grid. <laughs> Don't hate me for it. <laughs> but now, that only leaves four seats left, Paul. That's Mercedes, R&B, Alpine, and the Audi seat. So I already think that the Mercedes seat is going to be given to Kimi Antonelli. And I'm not going to tell you why. I'm going to show you. And you give me your reaction to it. There's Kimi at Spa. He's being squeezed. And he held, holds the wheel. And away he goes. I mean, spectacular pass. And... Balls of steel there. What do you think about that? Oh, he's a great driver. Will he be in the Mercedes seat next year? I don't know. I think we're going to get a surprise as to what's going to happen for one year at Mercedes. And I'm still putting money, you know, evens. I'm spreading my bet, which yeah. you might enjoy. Yeah. Uh, but us for one year. I uh, love us for one year. I love that. Yeah, he's behaved and he'll do what he's told and he'll support them while they just, I think it's a big risk putting Kimmy in as a junior. But yeah. if Carlos is going to Williams, where's Kimmy going to go? Is he going to be a reserve driver? Or are you going to buy him a seat at Alpine? What are you doing with Kimmy then? Possibly. I think everything's a possibility at Alpine at this stage, especially with their boss is gone. Who's going to be the boss next year? I think it's going to be the return of. Uh, uh, it's Gunther Steiner <laughs> or, or one or two others that have been languishing in the wings. Um, there's going to be some interesting things coming out of Alpine, but they are so dodgy at the moment. <laughs> you couldn't risk a mortgage on them. You know, like, will I have a job in three, six months? You could be fired up. So, I, I have the feeling that uh, Duhon is going to be in the seat. And the reason why he's been a reserve driver, I think, for the last two years. He won F2. It's his time. I mean, either he gets a seat now or what was winning F2 for? 
what was all the he's been with Alpine. I think they have enough data and time with him in the seat. I think they have enough analytics with him. I'm going to predict that it's going to be Jack Doohan next year. Um, I have an issue with the fact that we have a load of spare drivers who have not yet been re-signed or given seats that are qualified Formula One drivers. And two of those teams have been really struggling. They're down at the bottom. And I think their careers are going to get wasted, and I think they will get picked up. And again, that that leads back to Bottas. What's going to happen with Daniel? Um, it's, you know, and everyone's leaving it quite late. You know, I well, think the lower teams yeah. can do this. There's a lot of speculation going on with Daniel. You know, Daniel was seen in talks this weekend, and there he is talking to Christian Horner. And there is the principal for Alpine, right? I mean, a uh, RB right there. And then later, they had a, a video of Max and Daniel in the paddock with Daniel carrying both their helmets and Max being all gentle and happy. But I hate to ruin it for everybody out there. Daniel's not coming to Red Bull. And you want to know why? Because just literally five minutes ago, I got a text that Christian Horner just confirmed that Checo Sergio Perez will be in the seat for the remaining of the season. So all you Daniel fans, all you Liam Lawson fans, cry about it. Cry. Cry. What's your reaction to that, Paul? I, I think it would be, as we said the last podcast, when we said the wheels were coming off, I think that it would be embarrassing for the team if Checo was pushed aside before the end of the season. Will he be reassessed between now and the end of the season? Damn straight. So that really remains that we have that Audi seat out there. Now, you're saying it could be Valtteri or Valtteri could go to Mercedes and we just have a little clip of Valtteri and his best bud. So I'm hoping that Valtteri, out of all the guys left, gets a seat. Because we have Kevin Magnuson, we have Guan Zhao Yu, and then we also have Logan Sargent. We can pretty much be assured that Logan Sargent, unfortunately, will not. I mean, poor Logan. I mean, when you're having a bad day, Paul, or when you out there in the ether world are having a bad day, all you have to do is remember that Logan Sargent's having a worse day. Okay. And then you should feel a lot better about yourself because this poor guy, I mean, he's, he's gone. We all know that because Carlos Sainz is in his seat. So no other team's going to pick him up. And, you know, Guan Yu, Yu, he hasn't scored a point yet. He hasn't had a, a, a signature drive or a signature qualifying. So he's probably gone. So I think Valtteri is the guy who's going to get either that Mercedes seat, like you say, or the Audi seat. I wonder what Valtteri thinks. It's such a long lap. We get a, a bonus interview, and I think you got a bonus bum squeeze from Lewis. <laughs> I got a snake bite. <laughs> I love that guy, Paul. I do. I love Valtteri, man. He's won 10 Grand Prix. Did you know that when he was with Mercedes, he always made Q3. There wasn't one time in his stint with Mercedes that he was out in Q3 unless there was something wrong with the car. Did you know that? No, I didn't. That's a good stat. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Logan Sargent. Okay. So here's my deal with this. First of all, I love being on this podcast, on this YouTube page, across social media. It's America F1. And I have a huge respect for Liberty Media and what it has done for the sport and what it has brought to America. We're talking about three races a year now in America. And it's where the sponsorship is and it's where it's going to help to keep Formula One alive. You won't hear like you do with the European tracks, they're in trouble and they may close and they've got to renegotiate their contracts, etc. There's real funds coming out of America and America for all the people that moan and groan about, oh, it's American money, American sport. They're going to ruin it. They're going to water it down. 
I object to that. And, the, mm. and my purpose of saying this is it, it needs to be taken seriously that America has taken a proper interest and a proper uh, feeling for F1, and they're getting involved. And I love that. And my point about that is that we need an American driver. It helps it all along. And unfortunately, Logan is a bad pick. He just is. He's just, it's not happening for him. So we need someone like, what is it, Pato Award from Pato Award. And, a, and a load of the other guys that you see. Great characters, strong, uh, good racers, know how to get through, know how to qualify, know how to keep their heads together. Uh, so I'm just hoping that we eventually, in the next year or so, we will see another American come to the grid. I really hope so. Yeah. Uh, touche. Touche on oh, that. Thank you. America. Yeah. America. <laughs> so let's just get right into our spa Frankenstein recap. And let me put the banner up for spa. And there we go. And so now, Paul, why don't you take over and talk about the McLaren and Mercedes parallel on how two great Formula One powerhouses of all time can really make you have a bittersweet feeling about one-twos. I mean, we had McLaren last week, and now we have Mercedes with 1.5 kilos underweight, taking away a great drive from George Russell, but also really kind of pooping on an even better drive, in my opinion, of one Sir Lewis Hamilton, who had a great start and passed. You know, if, when you go to the replay, and this is, Oh, I'm a little, oh, a little upset about when you go to the replay of the Spa Frankenstein, the Belgian Grand Prix, and you know they have that one that's a short, like you can watch the whole thing, or you can just watch like ten minutes of it, like a review. They don't have the pass of Lewis on Charles Leclerc. They don't even show really Lewis until like lap forty, forty four, and why? Are they doing that to Lewis? My God, man, what a great drive in that car. The fourth prop, fourth best car on the grid. Take it away, Paul. Okay. First of all, let's recap on something. Spa Frankenstein has been the best race we've had this year. So better than the British it, Grand Prix? It was a better race because we sat there and we never took our eyes off. Everybody, I've been, I've been getting it through the clubs and everything else. The actual physical race was amazing. <laughs> Thanks for throwing me off. <laughs> the, the race was amazing. It just it never stopped. There was something happening every other lap, uh, whether it was strategy, whether it was overtaking, just the way that it unfolded. You never took your eyes off the track. So that was the first thing. And I really did, it did bring some energy again to Formula. So the second thing was, you asked about the two teams and the one-two drivers. So uh, I think McLaren, again, strategies got a little bit in the way here. And I think we all saw something weird unfold with Mercedes. And I do believe that it was George that called the strategy, which left yeah. him out long. Mm -hmm. It was such a sh I mean, like we all sat there. Those of us that are true Lewis Hamilton fans went, hmm, why isn't he passing him? Why isn't he catching him? And understood the strategy, and that was fine. But it was like, well, Lewis should have the pressure tires and should be able to pass him without too much grief. And that unfolded towards the last five, six, seven laps. And you're like, well, what the hell's going on? Why is George not trailing off with these tires? And why is Lewis not able to catch and pass? He was 0.7 of a second per lap faster. So it, it sort of unfolded itself. So, you, you know, know one thing I want to uh, interject in, in, in that, Paul, yeah. and I found very interesting, and even Lewis said it, after in the max cooldown room, 
he said, why? Actually, he said it in the Q&A when they all go up with the uh, media. He said, my team didn't inform me that George was on a one stop. Because if they would inform me that he was on a one stop, my tires were fresh. I would have stayed out. Then he also said on, I think it was lap 40 and 41 when he came in, he didn't really push because he was kind of saving his tires because he expected George to come in. in, Paul. I'm okay. trying to. F- so we're talking about this in such a sense that as if Mercedes tried to pull a fast one on Lewis, it wasn't like that. It was a case that um, George realized that he was going to take a chance and run longer with those tires. And technically, his tires should have made him weaker. And then Lewis could have stepped up. Now, I. I get why Lewis is upset that he doesn't feel the team informed informed him. Um, and a lot of fans, a lot of fans have objected and said conspiracies and all these things. But realistically, it was a last minute call. It was George's call. He said, I'm going to take the risk of running these tires. We've all seen the Formula One races where a blowout, Lewis won at Silverstone with a blown out tire. We've seen it. When some tires go too far and people push too much, you end up in trouble. And and he got away with it. George got away with it. However, he didn't because he ran too much off those tires. And he kept running. So I, I have a theory that, and it's kind of a lot of people said, if the car is tested with a dry weight, without the fuel. Right. But realistically, he was running fast lap without going into the pits twice. So therefore, he instead of going in, cool off for a couple of seconds and drive back out, which would have actually given him extra fuel by the end of the race. Now, right. that have been 1.5 kilos. I don't know. But it would have been part of it. Plus, as for those of you that don't know, uh, Spa does do a cool down lap. So when you finish on the main straight and they take a sharp right, they go back into the back end of the pits. So it's one of the only tracks that doesn't do, because of the length of it, they actually don't do a cool down. And for that purpose, he didn't get to pick up a load of rubber, which would add weight to the car. Right. Yeah, and I, I've been doing a little research on that from all the technical gurus out there, the engineers, my my uh, my nephew's an engineer, and I think my brother-in-law is an engineer, so I even asked them about it. So they said that, and all from what I've read, on the cool-down lap, all the bits and rubber you can pick up can add up to one kilo per tire. So you could hypothetically get three to four kilos just from the rubber that you picked up. But Mercedes, it's not like this is the first year that they don't do a cool down lap at Spa. This is what they do at Spa. They knew that. That's why when they showed Toto Wolff's face, he wasn't super excited because he knew. They also, in when you read the FIA report, they had asked Mercedes, did you drain out the fuel? And apparently they said they did, but they didn't. They didn't drain all of it. Correct. It's supposed to leave X. It's supposed to get pushed down to the way station, I believe. Uh, I don't did. think they were trying to pull. I don't think they were trying to pull a fast one. I think they were working within the guidelines, and they figured the car should have enough. What they don't have is the race games in their garage, and they don't get to put the car back into the garage before mm. it goes to the way station. So it's guesswork. They took a chance, and this time it failed. The last time now, we had this was what Sebastian. Sebastian yeah. in twenty twenty one. Yeah, I mean it happens. Yeah. It's 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 harsh, but it happens. And it wasn't a. It they took a chance. They rolled the dice. They took an extra card. It screwed up. I'm mean, going for George, but Lewis. Probably feels a bit more righteous about give, being given the win in the way I that mean, it came. Did you see that they had <laughs> people are crazy? So, <laughs> so the hat Lewis Hamilton, right? And he's totally when he went in, right? So he's going in for the second place, and you know how they go in front of the second place banner and they 
park their car. So going into the pit lane, the traffic on the radio was totally silent. There was no congratulations to Lewis. There was no great drive to Lewis. There was none of that. Silence on, on Mercedes' side, on the pit wall side. Silence on Sir Lewis Hamilton's side. He went in quiet as a mouse. Didn't say a word. And then when he was talking, you could see he was dejected. Now, I got a report by somebody. Somebody sent me this. This is actually Lewis Hamilton supposedly walking off with 1.5 kilos of weight from George's car. There Lewis is in the scooter. He's holding a bag and he has 1.5 kilos of weight in there. So. I've got images of him trying to drain the gas, the petrol, out of that car. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. He was so peed up. Oh, he was. He was very annoyed. And I don't know whether he was annoyed because the team didn't tell him and give him time to make up for it. You know, like, you know, go faster on his laps and push his car harder. We we will never know. This. We will actually never know. There's no way. But uh, very disappointing in the way that it was done. He feels the... The strategy was changed and he wasn't informed and given a chance to do what he needed to do, which is, it's not nice. I think that's fair. That's fair because he could have went, because he was saving his tires. He was managing the race. So if he knew George wasn't coming in, he would have pushed even more. And that could have been the difference between him passing George and him just getting close in the dirty air and not being able to pass George. And a lot of drivers were complaining about the dirty air and they said, well, once you got right up behind someone, it was really hard to pass if what, if you he weren't in the tried, dirt. He was trying twice to get really close. And then he said afterwards, when things were calm, he said, as soon as I got in the dirty air, George, I couldn't. And it unsettled me and the course. Yeah. And then you so, can't get the good sweep to go, the two of you to go together, and then you get the slip, and off you go. He, he couldn't get it. He couldn't do it. a lot of good places to, to pass in Spa, unfortunately. It's mostly ask to ask going up to El Rouge, either together then, or, you know, in, in the majority, it's like you go through a Rouge together, and then you go down to Kemmel Strait, and that's where you get the pass. And after that, it's a lot of twists and turns that you really have a hard time passing. Especially these a- big white cars. There's been a lot of talk of people saying that Mercedes did Lewis dirty because when you think about it, he had such a great, terrific drive. And if they would have had George do what McLaren had Lando do and switch places, maybe George would have had enough fuel left in the car and picked up enough bits because he would have to slow down to let Lewis by. And then they'd have still had their one two, or at worst, maybe um, Oscar Piastri would have passed George too, and at least Mercedes would have secured a one two or a one three, or worst case scenario, pit George like you should have anyway, and he would have been like fourth or fifth. You still got two cars in the points, but now you only have Lewis winning, and then you have a DQ with the other sister car. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? It, it, I don't. I don't think they've ever had a D. I don't think they've had a DQ once or twice in Mercedes. I don't even remember them. I think one so of the them last- was where one of the flaps on Lewis's yeah. car went loose and was deemed illegal. And oh no, my so god, that was, the that was the plank last year in Austin. The, yeah. the plank. No, no, no. This was a couple of years ago. When well, last the, year they had a DQ. DRS opened. Yeah. So and last it was year too far. So last year they had a DQ with Lewis and Charles Leclerc. If you remember, Lewis finished second and Charles Leclerc finished third, and they both got DQ'd because the plank had wear on it. This was oh, here. Yeah, 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 I remember that. So yeah. the point is, none of these things, you've got to consider the marvel that is Formula One. The marvel that is, in some cases, anywhere from 800 to 2,000 people working in a team, creating a car with a different engine, different gearbox, different setup, different era, and they're coming in 0.01, 0.02 of a second, or within thousands of a second. It's simply stunning the marvel that is Formula One, and at the very same time, 
how one half turn of a bolt could change an entire car and cause a DNF. It, it's you know, so they have to be congratulated. Nine times out of ten, twenty cars start, twenty cars without crashing, twenty cars finish. Uh, it's just a mark. This is why I love Formula. Could you imagine when we had Max winning the first two out of three races? And then Max winning the first, I think, five out of seven. And he's up to six wins for the year. Could you imagine that the number two driver who would have the most wins to now would be Lewis Hamilton? Can you imagine where that car was in the beginning of the year? Yeah. Uh, look, Sean, th- this has been a stunning year. Nobody expected this. So this is the, this is the epitome and the annoyance of when they do a real change. And the real changes last for three or four years at a time. It's like a presidency term. And <laughs> <laughs> you get in, you get in, and then you are ahead. So Red Bull, they got it. And for all of our bitching and annoyance and everything else, right? Red Bull, get in, they got it right. They had the marvel of Adrian as well. And then we move on a year. Now we everybody expected that they would the rest of the teams would catch up understand what Red Bull is doing, what made it marvel, and then they would start to apply those things to the cars. Nobody figured. So this is like, we've still got a year to go. So we've got a year and a half. And already, we've had this conversation, the wheels are coming off. So (laughs) the wheels are coming off of Red Bull. And now you are watching the people catching up. It's not that Red Bull's done something wrong. It's now these teams are catching up. And what a stunning, if it hadn't have been illegal, it was a one two for Mercedes. That's stunning at this stage. And they won, and they won. It's like amazing. And I did say on the show last week, watch out for Ferrari. And in fairness, even though Max got pole, who was actually on pole in the end? Charles Leclerc. In a Ferrari. They're not to be discounted. And I'm telling you, the rest of this season, Mercedes, McLaren, Ferrari, Mercedes, Red Bull, it's going to go four teams. Four teams, it's all to play for. If Ferrari, which had a great start to the season, if they didn't kind of boggle it in that mid part, they'd be right there in the Constructors' Championship. They kind of had, you know, about three, four races of, like, Ferrariism where they boggled this or they boggled that or Carlos, like, went off the track or Charles went off the track. But now we have McLaren right there, and they can actually win this Constructors' title as long as Norris and really Oscar. I mean, is that's another thing I want to ask you. Is Oscar the lead driver for the, the some after the summer break? Is Oscar the guy, or do you still think Lando just had a bad day and you know he's going to get it together? Because I mean, this guy, I mean, I, he was always making fun of everybody about having the fastest car, and now he has the fastest car and he's not winning. What do you make of it? Honestly, I'm having issues with Norris's mental state. And as good as a driver as he is on the right day with the right reasons. Uh, and it's it's like watching the rookie and then, you know, two or three years in between. And then they're in the right car and then they start to get really good. But Norris just keeps faltering. And also there's been some team issues. But I am not sure. You asked a question. Do I think Oscar is the lead driver? I think Oscar is stronger in mental capacity, and I think he's he's got the potential to, to outmaneuver Norris. If they went if they went with no instruction, they were really racing, I think Oscar could take that. And you I know, think he could you really bring up a really, really good point, Paul. And that point is that Lando Norris's mental faculties or his his mental toughness doesn't seem as strong as some of the other drivers because he really beats himself up when you watch his body mannerisms he's always slumped over and in the pen when they're talking to him he's always just self-deprecating he's always saying how bad he did this or how bad and i'm like come on dude 
you got to have more of a positive outlook because that stuff becomes self-fulfilling. You put it out into the world and then all of a sudden it happens. Okay. All right. A couple of things. First of all, to be a Formula One driver, you are the pinnacle. You have had people put so much money into you sitting in that seat. Sponsorships and mechanics, meaning the whole car. Everybody trusts in you that they believe and they've paid you to be in that car. Um, and then for you to go and have a bad race and stand in the pen and beat the crap out of yourself in public is just so, you know, they, they get training for it. Now, let's be realistic about it. Uh, the younger generation are far more aware of their feelings. They're far more in touch of mental situations. And I absolutely clap and applaud for all of that. I really do. But when you are one of 20 people who get to sit in a car like that, you really have to control those emotions when you get into the press pens. And you have to keep it until you can go back to your room and do a Magnuson with a Fox smash, right? It, you just, you have to. This is what, this is the public persona and this is your, you know, your, your private moment. And we know, we know publicly Lando said a couple of years ago he, he struggled, but he came back from that. Where's the happy, jokey, laughy Lando mm -hmm. sniggering in, in the press conferences? Where's he gone? You know, and now he's acting like his career is going to be gone next year. So this year really matters. And he should be taking it on the chin and learning from it, being happy that, that the McLaren are providing him with a car that's able to win some races, get him some poles. So he shouldn't be like, all my eggs are in one basket right now. I have to be the one that wins 2024. It will come. And as we said, you know, as Red Bull starts to undress itself uh, and everybody else starts to dress their car and be challenging, they've got every opportunity to win far more this year and maybe even win in 2025. So they, he shouldn't be beating himself up. Yeah. I he shouldn't be beating himself up, but he does. And I think somebody should get a hold to him and say, you have to change your outlook. And even though you don't have the best results, but you gave the best effort, you should start talking about the positives like Lewis does. Just talk about the positives that have happened and then move on. Yeah. That way, the public always sees that side of you and not the, oh, woe is me. You know, What's that guy? He was from the Disney car. Oh, Eeyore, Eeyore. Oh, whoa, me. Oh, I know. That, that's that's totally Lando. That might be his new nickname, Eeyore. Maybe I'll start calling him Eeyore. Oh, I could have done so much better. I mean, come on, Lando, man. Smile. You got a great smile. You play video games. You're young. You got, you got some really cool, authentic, like old school cars that I've seen when he drives in Monaco man, be happy about your life and just give positivity out there. And it's going to happen for you, brother. If Stop. I could give him one piece of advice, stop yeah. hanging around with Max. What, Paul, man, stop reading my mind, Paul. Don't stop it. Stop yes. it. Tell stop me it. he hasn't changed. Since it was public that the two of them are hanging around. Lando's changed since then. And since he's rubbed up in a few races with Max, he's just changed. He's because the people you hang out with, Paul, they rub off on you. You hang out with all doctors, you start talking doctor vernacular. Remember, there's all these people who weren't lawyers, they weren't doctors, and they pretended to be, and nobody knew the difference. Nobody yeah. could tell. Because the people, your circle, that becomes part of you. Some of the, you take a little bit of them and it rubs off on you. And if Max is, and we don't know Max personally, we only see him on TV and we see him live. So we're not at his house having dinner. But the perception is he's, he's pretty rough to deal with. And he has his, his, his out, outward persona is kind of gruff. 
Now, if Lando's taking on that persona, that's not a good thing, man. That, that it's, it's not, not. It's not. It's not wearing well for him. If it was a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, it's not wearing well for him. This change of character when he's actually in a winning opportunity, and uh, he's taking the losses too hard, and you know he's he's not enjoying the moment that he's in Formula One with a car that has potential. Every time it doesn't give it to him, he like. Paul, as we close down our. Summer break, America F1 Spa, Frank and Sean recap. And we go on our summer break for four weeks, and we're still going to have some shows over the summer break to keep everyone entertained out there. Well, I'm going to play a game of, you know, uh, what's it called? Musical chairs. So right now, we're going to take the McLaren right now, and we're going to take Lando out of the seat in the McLaren. We're going to take Oscar out of the seat in the McLaren. We're going to put the original McLaren guys we're going to put Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso in that in those seats right now do you think in these last 6 races which by everybody's standard by everybody not just me and not just you Paul but everyone's saying that McLaren's had the best car for the last 6 races how many of those races if Sir Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso was in that seat how many would they have won so fantasy F1, um, and you've chosen the team they're going to be in. Uh, honestly, I've always said Lewis could drive the wheels off a shopping trolley. So I think that if he had, was in a car that would provide an opportunity, he probably would have got four of them, and Alonso probably would have got two of them. It was still they fight in that won dog. All the races, exactly. If Fernando and Lewis were in that McLaren, all six of these races would have been won by them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the difference between a championship driver and drivers that are just good. Rookie or maybe plus. Very good. R- would say it again? Rookie plus. Right. Because they aren't capitalizing on their situation of having the best car right now. And it seems like on certain tracks, obviously Mercedes is catching and Ferrari will be coming back. So they might've missed an opportunity. They got two out of the six wins, but they probably should have had at least four. Four. At least four. Yeah. Now the difference is, if I may, the, um, let's just say for instance, we're watching Williams next year and Carlos is in that car. And he's midfielding because that's what the car delivers. But he will use his tactician head. So it like the, 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 the professor. You remember the professor back in the, what's the 80s? Um, and everyone said, oh, he's like a professor on the track because he works out all the tactics. Are we talking about Alan Pross? Yeah, thank you. Alan Pross. Alan Pross. And... You know, if you're, you're watching, like, there's no question that we've seen Sergio drive tactically and keep his head during racing. So if he's in that Williams next year and the car is midfielding, he will get it into where it is scoring points pretty much every race, as long as the car keeps delivering. And they, they do better with the error. So what I'm saying is if you had the older shoulders of Lewis and Alonso, who are tacticians, they would have pulled those McLarens way much forward and probably would have won two, maybe, sorry, the, the, the two plus two plus maybe one. So they probably would have won four or five races based on the tactician attitude. You're not going to get such great comments, opinions, responses from any other channel. You'll get other responses and other opinions, but they won't be as spot on as what you get here at America F1. Paul predicted that the Ferraris were going to have a comeback for Spa Frankenship. Last week, myself and Scott predicted that Oscar Piastri was going to win that race. We're two for two, baby. Join us after the summer break. Actually, not after the summer break. During the summer break, we're going to have a couple special shows between Paul and I. We're going to pick out one great Formula One champion, and we're going to do a whole entire show on just that champion. We're going to do two of those shows. So out of these four-week breaks, we're going to do two shows on champions of Formula One for your enjoyment. 
We would thank you, everyone out there who's picked up our channel. We've just recently got from YouTube that now we can have a membership as part of our channel. I'm really happy that we finally got to that. We've been monetized by YouTube. It just came last night. I'm so thrilled. And it's all to you people out there that have found our channel and have taken us in your homes and on your phones and listening to us on your car. We appreciate you so much. Please tell your friends and family we're on YouTube. We're on Apple Music. We are on Spotify and wherever you listen to podcasts. And we're also on Instagram on America Media F1. And Paul, give your plugs too before we go. Oh, of course. Well, very quickly, let's just say hi to Graham in the UK. Long-term friend, huge Formula One fan. Uh, my sister, Linda, she will love that. And then I want to say hi to Naomi in the Netherlands. Okay, she's in Amsterdam. And everybody, if you are interested, we have a club uh, called the Sir Lewis Hamilton Ferrari F1. And that's on Facebook. And this is America F1. And I'm really enjoying doing these podcasts with you. And hopefully this channel is going to grow and grow. And I hope you all appreciate his sweatshirt. Stand up a little. Stand up a little. Look, look. America F1. <laughs> no, he's blocked the camera. It went into. Anyway, thank you for having me again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. We also have America F1 fan page that we started. So if you want to go to Facebook and join the America F1 fan page and get little tidbits from Paul and myself and others that contribute, that'd be great. Or you can ask questions and on that we'll respond. Because the one thing that we do on this channel, when you put a comment up on YouTube or you make a comment up on Facebook, we are the ones that actually respond. There's no bots. We don't have any secretaries. We're the ones that do it. And so you can have an interaction with somebody that hopefully you're enjoying. And so with that, keep on racing, everybody. <laughs>